Shalom, and welcome to Tov, the Jewish News Channel. My name is Ruchi Avital, and we have with us today a guest from abroad. His name is Francisco Gil White. He is an anthropologist and a historian. He has a website called managementofreality.com, and he invites you to visit it. And he has a lot to say about a lot of things. He's very, very well versed in Israel and what's happening here in Israel, the Israeli-Arab conflict. You didn't follow the oppressor-oppressed um, rule. It was clear to me that there was something about the West that I didn't really understand because the entire story that I had heard my whole life was that the United States was the big protector of Israel. But if the United States is forcing the organization created by the exterminator of the European Jews onto the Jewish state, when the Jewish state was created to protect the Jewish people from you know, Nazi genocides, then what was the United States doing introducing this organization created by the Nazi killer of the Jews into the Jewish state. That obviously meant to me that I didn't understand the world. So I started researching the entire history of U.S. foreign policy towards the Jewish people and towards the Jewish state. And what I found when I started looking at this information without the filter of the mainstream media and mainstream academia, was that uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Israel had been anything but uh, uh, f f favorable. The, the United States foreign policy, in my conclusion, after doing all this research, it has been designed to undermine the security of the Jewish state. And lately, this has become very obvious to people who are paying attention to the behavior of U.S. bosses in the wake of uh, uh, October 7th. But um, bef before that, it was a lot harder to notice because of the bar barrage of m mainstream media and established academia. So I, I, I'm going to ask you just uh, a simple person's question. A sure. simple person, we, c we, we know, I, I think I can hear you making a distinction between the American people and the American government and American policies. They're not the same. The American people are generally favor very highly favorable towards Israel. We see that in poll after That's poll right. after poll, even or especially even since October 7th. And behind the scenes, we know there's all kinds of stuff going on that we don't understand. We don't understand why President Biden came to Israel and he, he spoke very movingly about his commitment to Israel's safety and future and said don't. But then there were some people who were saying that don't wasn't directed only at Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah, but it was directed at Israel also. Is that what you're saying? Well, clearly, because um, the entire thrust of U.S diplomacy towards Israel since October 7th has been geared towards stopping Israel from achieving a real victory over its enemies. Uh, and not only that, we know that uh, uh, shortly before the Hamas attack of October 7th, the U.S. released uh, billions of dollars for Iran. And after the Israeli operation in Gaza began, they sent a hundred million dollars to Hamas. Uh, but it's even worse than that because we know that the U.S. bosses are very intimately allied with Qatar. Uh, they have their most important military base in the Middle East in Qatar. And Qatar cannot exist without U.S. protection. I mean, Qatar is a tiny little peninsula, completely flat, entirely made of sand, with the biggest gas reserves in the world. So obviously it is a prize for anybody who wants to conquer Qatar, which means that Qatar cannot exist without U.S. military protection, which in turn means that the U.S. has total control over Qatari foreign policy. And what is Qatari foreign policy? It is to support and fund the uh, psychopathic terrorists of Hamas who are entirely oriented publicly towards the genocidal destruction of the Jewish state. So this is very confusing. Uh, this is very confusing for this simple person. 
We, I mean, I remember when President Obama made his first speech, which was in Cairo, first international speech in Cairo, and he basically yeah. threw Mubarak under the bus in favor of yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood That's is right. also Qatar and also Hamas. Um, what, what is the end game here for the United States? I mean, it's very difficult to understand. For not the United well, States, but is, for uh, the policymakers or the State Department, perhaps in the United States. Exactly. That's that distinction is very important. So it's it's not an end game for the United States. The United States is a, a few hundred million people. Uh, no, this is an end game for the U.S. bosses, the people running the system. And in order to understand what they want, you have to do a little history to know what their ideology is. Uh, for me, a very important book. Uh, to understand all this has been Edwin Black's uh, War Against the Weak, Eugenics and America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. That book is a watershed because what Edwin Black documented was that the people running the United States were also the people running the international eugenics movement in the first half of the 20th century. And that's Perhaps you key. explain to our listeners or our viewers exactly what eugenics is. Yes, I was going to. So th that's key because uh, the eugenics movement is the parent movement that produced German Nazism. OK, uh, eugenics is the original ideology of the alleged, you know, biological superiority of the Germanic stock. That's that's what eugenics is. And, and they were always interested in destroying modern democracy, because the eugenics argument is that uh, people in the in the in the lower classes don't have enough G Germanic blood and therefore they are mentally retarded. This is what they claim. And so they created these IQ tests so that they had a pseudoscientific because they're a fraud. And, and this gave them a pseudoscientific excuse to start eliminating the rights and liberties of ordinary people in the modern West. The German Nazis are the evolution of German eugenics. German eugenics was funded and led from the United States. To give you an example, the 1935 Nuremberg Laws of Hitler, those laws which started carting people off to uh, concentration camps, those laws are modeled on the legal precedents in the United States that were achieved by the American eugenicists. So if you look at the history of the uh, early of the first half of the 20th century in the United States, you see that in 1924, there was a very important Supreme Court case called Buck versus Bell. Buck versus Bell was a great victory for the eugenicists because it made legal the forced forcible sterilization or incarceration of people that the eugenicists decided were feeble-minded with these fraudulent eugenic uh, uh, IQ tests. Uh, and they started putting people in concentration camps in the United States. And this is something that most people don't know about anymore because the history of eugenics has also been suppressed. When I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, I would ask my students to raise their hands if they recognized the word eugenics and very few hands would go up. I was not asking them to explain the history of eugenics, just to Have recognize them, the term. Did you ever ask them if they recognize the name Margaret Sanger? Well, uh, they also don't know anything about that. So Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood, which was an integral uh, component of the eugenics movement. Um, and uh, some people who read about eugenics do find out about Margaret Sanger, but the, the dots that they never get to connect, which is what Edwin Black has done for us, is they never get to connect the fact that the most important leaders and financiers of the eugenics movement, people like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, uh, uh, Thomas Watson, the guy who was running IBM, these people were sending a lot of money to Germany a lot of money to Germany, helping create the German eugenics movement that became German Nazism. This was all coming from the US power elite. So once you understand that the people running the United States are eugenicists who are very fond of the German Nazis and helped the German Nazis get set up, once you know that, 
you can begin to understand the post-war foreign policy of the United States because nobody removed the eugenicists from power in the United States. Wow. I mean, I, the names Ford and Rockefeller and so on uh, resonate very strongly with all kinds of conspiracy theories, which are probably not theories. And Joseph Kennedy as well, I believe, was one of those power brokers, was he not? Yes, Joseph Kennedy was uh, a very pro-Nazi. He was ambassador to the United States uh, in uh, Great Britain, and he was indeed uh, instrumental in all of this. So this is all extremely disturbing, and uh, we hear very, very little of this. It, there doesn't seem to be any public interest or any interest, I wouldn't say public, but journalistic interest in uncovering any of this. Does journalism even well, still exist? No, it hasn't existed for a long time. So uh, the eugenicists took over the entire media and academic establishment a very long time ago. This began in the late 19th century when people like John D. Rockefeller and uh, uh, Senior and other great industrialists began taking over the big media and also established academia. So uh, Rockefeller, together with Carnegie, created some, something called the General Board of Education. Uh, and that, with their donations, they started taking over the university system. If you look at the grants for research in the United States from the early 20th century to the present, uh, you'll see that the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, the Ford Foundation have been the main sources of money for scientific research. Uh, and by doing that, they've basically taken over the uh, university establishment. <clears throat> they've also taken over the big media. Uh, one thing that's very important to understand is that uh, the American eugenicists, uh, in particular the Rockefellers, were completely, very heavily involved in the creation of U.S. intelligence. And uh, U.S. intelligence, or the, let us say, the, the main U.S. intelligence infrastructure was created in 1947 with the National Security Act. When they did that, they incorporated the people that Rockefeller had been putting together to study psychological warfare in the 1930s. So the Rockefellers had had an entire scientific project to study how to use the mass media to manipulate democratic citizens. That was going on in the 30s. Those researchers became the psychological warfare experts of the United States during World War II. And after World War II, they became the professors of communications research in high prestige universities that were, and these professors were being funded by the CIA clandestinely so that they would create these communications departments that train absolutely everybody that works in the media, uh, uh, in the modern media system. So through the uh, intelligence services, the eugenicists acquired control of the entire media space uh, that, uh, quote unquote, informs people about what's, what's supposedly going on. גדלתי בישראל בשנות ה-90. תמיד ידעתי שהעמדות שלי, עמדות של ימין, לאומי, דורשות שכנוע, נימוק והוכחה כדי לנהל שיח. הכרתי והעמקתי בדעות של הצד שמנגד מתוך מתן כבוד. מהר מאוד הבנתי שהאנשים שעמדו בצד שכנגד לא הכירו בלגיטימיות של העמדות שלי. היום, 30 שנה אחרי, בצד השני הדברים לא רק שלא השתנו, הם הפכו גרועים הרבה יותר. הרטוריקה הפטרונית, האדנותית, הפכה למרד אלים, מסוכן, שהוביל אותנו ואיפשר את טבח שמחת תורה. אנחנו בערוץ טוב החלטנו להחליף את השיח המכיל והסבלני של הימין בשיח של הובלה והנהגה. רגשי הנחיתות של המחנה הלאומי חייבים להיפסק. במועדון היחידה אנחנו בונים את הקבוצה שתוביל את חילופי האליטות ההכרחית בתקופה הקרובה. אז הצטרפו גם אתם ליחידה ותוכלו גם לתמוך ולחזק את הפעילות של ערוץ טוב וגם לקחת חלק בקבוצה איכותית שתיפגש בקביעות ותבנה שיח חדש בחברה הישראלית ותוביל אותנו לעתיד טוב יותר.